There are many shows dedicated to Magic the Gathering strategies, decks, and formats. But unlike all of them, this channel is about discussing an individual card, an isolated card, an unrelated card. This is an Magic Card. Hello, Internet Strangers, and welcome to the sixth installment of my rickety clown car of a YouTube channel, and Magic, Magic card, card, where I exhaustively discuss a completely random Magic Card. My name is Dusty Cupboards, and I hope you're ready for another 15 minutes of unfiltered mouth words and unwarranted tangents. But before we get to any of that, I've got to get to the comments from last week's video. CamComGab says, a new and Magic Card video saves their day. I'm happy to hear this, CamComGab, and if I could release a new video every day, I would. But I can't. Dreadmaw the Gathering left another incredibly long comment. I debated whether or not I wanted to feature a commenter two weeks in a row, but I figure if I'm going to feature anybody repeatedly, it would make sense for it to be Dreadmaw. A lot of the points they make are certainly valid, and I especially appreciate them pointing out the potential upside of having cards that cost lots of mana. There's a reason why Scornful Egotist was in Scourge. Max Lewin says that my videos have brought him almost as much joy as his new puppy. I requested that he post pictures of his new puppy, and unfortunately he was not able to comply. So I'm going to have to rewind and remove this comment from the video. And without further delay, let's jauntily proceed over to our primary subject, one of the most infamous cards in the ongoing history of Magic the Gathering. Uh, we are back. We are back at Gatherer with our beautiful, beautiful elephant boy. Um, you'll see here the symbol there is colorless even though the symbol here is colored in because on mirrodin they, they didn't they didn't use colored mana symbols so that's kind of cool like all of the cards we've talked about this card has only been printed once maybe the card we get this week shall have been reprinted many many times people like to talk about reprinting fetch lands how about reprint loxodon mender okay let's go it's red it's a red card. Oh, it's a red card, and it's from Dual Decks Anthology, Elves vs. Goblins. I love these stupid dual decks. Look at this Look at this ridiculous set symbol. I'm going to talk about that bad boy. I haven't even looked at what the card does. Hopefully this card's interesting. It's uncommon. It's got to be good. I am not going to be able to pronounce this, this artist's name, so that's fun. Ooh, and it's been reprinted. It's been printed more than once. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we are all talking about. Skirk Drill Sergeant is a two mana red uncommon creature from Legions, the second set in Onslaught block, and the 28th magic card set ever devised. You heard me right, this is a red card. Bust out those bingo sheets. Legions is the second set from a triad of sets, which means that it was a cute little duckling set with only 145 cards. The code name for Legions during development was Mo, which made me think that Onslaught and Scourge would be named Larry and Curly, but then I realized that couldn't be the case because Mo is always listed first when referencing the three stooges, and this hunch was correct, as Onslaught was nicknamed named Manny, and Scourge was nicknamed Jack. The ordering of these names is relevant though, as they were chosen to be easily sequenced. Apparently, Manny, Mo, and Jack are the Pet Boys, mascots for the automotive store Pet Boys, and photorealistic depictions of the company's three founders, Emmanuel Rosenfield, Maurice Strauss, Mo Radovitz, and W. Graham Jackson. You might have astutely noticed that I just listed four individuals. Emmanuel is Manny, Maurice and Mo have somehow been melded into a singular Mo, and W. Graham Jackson, whose first name I could not figure out, is simply known as Jack. Combining names is fine, but combining likenesses is more challenging. So you might have already guessed that the logo doesn't contain all four of the founders, and that is correct. It actually only contains two of them, because despite retaining the Manny, Mo, and Jack names for marketing, the logo actually depicts Manny, Maurice, and Maurice's brother, Isaac. And if you buy into conspiracy theories, then perhaps the logo contains none of the Pet Boys at all, and is instead a secret homage to the fascist Axis leaders from World War II. If you already knew who Manny, Mo, and Jack were, you probably grew up inside of a Pet Boys store, because I certainly had no idea. And it turns out that a significant portion of the employees at Wizards of the Coast also didn't know who they were, which defeated the entire purpose in giving the sets an onslaught block these sequential names. I would posit that using the names of the Three Stooges would have been much more effective, and for the remainder of this video, I shall be pretending as if that were the case. Legions, also known as Mo, wink wink, released on Monday, February 3rd, 2003, which makes it a member of Generation Z. I tried to look up some examples of things that people from Gen Z like, but all I got was lazy BuzzFeed articles which made me doubt the very concept of digital media. February 3rd is also 
to the birthday of Warwick Davis, though, who has portrayed a variety of small characters in films that range from entertainingly bad to pretty good to Val Kilmer-tastic. Warwick Davis also portrayed himself in the Ricky Gervais show Life's Too Short, which is absolutely spectacular despite not having Val Kilmer in it at all. Lots of other very important things also happened on February 3rd, but I'm not going to talk about any of them even a little bit. I just want to make it seem like I'm moving on to other subjects to trick you into leaving a comment telling me that Val Kilmer was in fact in Life's Too Short. Gotcha, buddy. Better go delete that comment. I know everywhere Val Kilmer has ever been, and based on some pretty solid data points, I have a good idea about where he's going. I've seen every Val Kilmer movie that I can think of, which is probably at least a significant portion of them. Happy birthday, Warwick. Legion stands alone amongst magic sets as perhaps being the most bizarre in its premise. Last week, we mentioned Antiquities, a set which was fixated on artifice. The week before that, I mentioned Future Sight, a set which literally contained cards from the future. And considering I'm going to painstakingly discuss every magic card ever printed, it would make sense that eventually I'm going to talk about the set Torment, which contained significantly more black cards than the other four colors. But as far as wacky set concepts are concerned, I would suggest that Legions takes home the horse necklace. Unlike most sets which contain a somewhat predictable balance of artifacts, lands, creatures, instants, sorceries, planeswalkers, enchantments, and tribal cards, Legions bucked that trend like a bucking bronco. Another heavily artifact-focused set? Nay, my friends. As the name Legions implies, the set Legions contains legions of creatures. Every card in the set is a creature. You love casting auras? Too bad. Big fan of curses? No luck. Collect cartouches? Not one. We're looking at an endless sea of dudes here. And for the record, I don't mean dudes in a gender-specific way, because I know a lot of ladies watch my show, and I wouldn't want to alienate any of my 317 fans. Also, more specifically, all three of the legendary characters in Legions are actually ladies. You've got a spooky lady, and this lady who appears to be some kind of bird, and Mist Form Ultimus, whose defining characteristic is having as many characteristics as possible, which would make it more likely to have all genders as opposed to no gender, despite using non-gendered pronouns. Among the 145 creature cards present among Legion's 145 card cards is card number 112, Skirk Drill Sergeant. Following Skirk Alarmist, but preceding Skirk Marauders, it was a very Skirk-intensive time period, with 4 out of 10 unique Skirk cards being printed in Legions, 3 of them coming in the Big Duck set Onslaught which preceded it, and 2 more Skirks appearing in Scourge which came after. All of these sets featured the old card frame, but following Scourge in 8th edition, we will see the modern card frame introduced, which I strongly disliked when I was too young to have good opinions. If you had asked me yesterday what Skirk meant, I would have told you that it is a specific tribe of goblins who hail from the Skirk Mountains on Dominaria. But yesterday, I was a fool and an imbecile. Today, through the wonders of reading stuff on the internet, I am a genius and fully aware that the Skirk are not a tribe of goblins, but a ridge upon which many tribes of many things reside within the larger context of the Pardic mountain range on the continent of Otaria on Dominaria. This really shows how big Dominaria is compared to Magic's other planes, as we have ten different cards named after a mere ridge. While the Skirk Ridge is home to a host of creatures, the goblins are still likely the most well-known. Skirk Prospector is practically a household name by this point, showing up in historic, modern, and even legacy. I have a distant memory of Skirk Fire Marshal being good, but let's chalk that up to the stupidity of childhood. Simply being a goblin increases a card's playability across formats though, as they are the characteristic race for red and have lots of tribal support and a fast aggressive strategy that tends to transcend the difference between constructed environments. Goblins have become a through line in fantasy gaming and fiction. They are almost a default, a preset combination of enthusiastic mischief, wanton violence, and comical stupidity. The goblin is also the nickname of a trans Neptune an object in the outer reaches of our solar system, known more formally by the less memorable designation of 541132 Lelea Kohanua. But considering this minor planetoid has an orbital radius of between 65 and 2,000 astronomical units, this tangent is especially far-flung, even for this channel. The goblins from the Skirk Ridge of the Pardic Mountains on the continent of Otaria are pretty close to the standard model. Magic contains a variety of other goblins on other planes, including lumpy-headed mogs bred for brutality by the Evancars of Wrath, the blue monkey goblins of Ixalan, the short shoulder filling goblins of Mirrodin, the mirror-hating hunchback Aki of Kamigawa, the Ak, which are big, big goblins who contribute one of only 13 three-letter magic cards ever printed, the smarty pants Chiron of Mercadia, the goblins from Tarkir who look like the trolls from Troll 2, and the predictably whimsical Bogarts of the plane diurnally known as Lorwyn, who look a lot like the goblins from Labyrinth, one of which was played by Warwick Davis. Happy birthday, Warwick. Technically, David Bowie also played a goblin in that movie, since his character was the Goblin King, but compared to the the other goblins, he seems to have been born with a rare condition called being very handsome. To this day, the card Goblin King in Magic the Gathering is sometimes lovingly known as David Bowie. Goblins are originally from European folklore and have a wide variety of depictions there, sometimes more akin to elves or gnomes, but they have become more solidified in modern consciousness as small monstrous humanoids due to J.K. Tolkien's description of them in his famous book series, Game of Thrones. 
goblins. This description would become further cast into the communal canon through the inclusion of goblins as an enemy in the foundational role-playing game Mazes and Monsters. Looking at the artwork on Skirk Drill Sergeant, we see figures who are clearly goblinoid, bald-headed pickle green murder clowns ready to descend from their ridge and do hilarious violence things. We spoke previously of pulp art when looking at the armor-clad figures shown below a specific very virgin dwelling where Mr. Something Krovax and his nuclear family once resided. But if that painting said pulp, then this one cups its hands and says it slightly louder, as if it's trying to get somebody's attention. Even the expressive glyph-like all-caps signature at the bottom is incredibly pulp in nature. I am not overly familiar with the artist, Alex Horley, but fortunately he has a website which contains lots of information about himself. Also fortunately, it appears that the website hasn't been updated since at least 2016, but it's hard to tell since the page for latest updates is just blank. The most recent hot news on the hot news page is about the artwork for the Rob Zombie record Rat Regeneration, which was released in 2013. His bio contains a wealth of information including numerous direct references to pulp artists like the iconic Frank Frazetta. His bio also explains that his name was originally Alessandro Orlandelli, but he changed it to Alex Horley for professional purposes. It's heartening to me that from judgment onward, he began hyphenating his name as Horley Orlandelli to bring back his actual surname. I could spend forever poring over Alessandro's life story, as told in great detail, easily found on his time capsule of the website. Not only has he illustrated 102 cards for magic, but he has also contributed to Heavy Metal Magazine, Starcraft, Diablo, Harry Potter, Neon Magic the Gathering, also known as Hearthstone, World of Warcraft, this amazing World of Warcraft promotional tie-in from McDonald's in China, and this even more amazing set of World of Warcraft promotional cups available only at Carl's Jr., also known as Hardy's. The pure amount of overlap that Alex Horley has with pretty much anything you thought was cool growing up is simply too expansive to detail. And some of the entries I listed might have seemed kind of silly, but make no mistake, Horley can paint his buns off. This piece of Frankenstein fighting raptors is gorgeous, and he is truly deserving of being discussed alongside his pulp idols. I also have to show you the painting he did for the Mars Attacks trading cards, which shows the eponymous Martians being viciously gored by a Triceratops. It's not really important how these characters are encountering dinosaurs. What's important is that when they do encounter them, they are obliged to do battle. Some people might not be aware that the Mars Attack trading cards are actually the origin of that franchise, making Mars Attacks one of only two films I know of that is based solely on a series of trading cards. It should also be noted that many of Alex's illustrations feature Stacy Walker, who he lists as his muse, and who has her own website which is literally a work of art. You can find a link to Stacy's website on Alex's website, right below the link to Rob Zombie's MySpace, and I strongly encourage all of you to go visit these anachronistic wonderlands, and then go watch Ricky Gervais's show, Life's Too Short, starring Warwick Davis. The show is super funny. Skirk Drill Sergeant contains many of the hallmarks of Horley's prototypical pulp style, from the simplified background, dramatic poses, heavy shadows, overly detailed musculature, and an excellent use of texture. It's great how the fluttering fabric of the aforementioned sergeant is wholly backlit and curls in an unreal fashion, which mirrors the large billowing plume of smoke which hangs over the raging battle below. We see another diagonal composition in this piece, with the straight line of the reluctant goblin's spear guiding our eyes towards the chaotic conflict towards which they are being guided. The sky above is roughly blotted in with an array of warm colors which transitions from orange, yellow, and green to a rosy pink along the subtle outline of the distant Pardic mountaintops. The fact that these warm colors pervade the entirety of the piece is a common feature of pulp illustration, which tends to work in clear layers. We can imagine that Alex first put down a solid plane of yellow over an initial sketch before then blocking in the other elements. Another common feature of pulp art is a very strong differentiation in the level of detail between the central figures and the supporting elements. The two goblins are rendered much more clearly with the rest of the piece being more like a study or a sketch than a realistic depiction. This focus gives the overall scene a sense of chaotic impermanence and an epic atmospheric dream like tone. The extreme contrast present on the goblins is likely a result of putting down a solid black layer over the entirety of their forms, and then working a light onto dark to sculpt the curvature of their fibrous muscles and ragged garb. Lastly, the texture on the rock at the bottom could be expertly applied with a range of simple techniques. The trademark of all pulp art is both its effective impact and also the economy with which it produced. Pulp artists are experts of their craft, capable of making enthralling art with a set of well-honed methods that have a long-lasting appeal, despite a relatively minimal time investment. This might seem to be a way of deriding the style, but there is nothing wrong with working smart instead of working hard. And knowledge of color theory, framing, and anatomy are hard-earned alongside the skill needed to effectively produce such art. Alex has a lot of great work throughout his magic catalog, including iconic cards like Chromatic Star, Beastmaster's Ascension, Keldon Marauders, Mind Moil, Herald of Leshrac, which I've mentioned previously, Noggle Ransacker, who is a Noggle and therefore deserves to be mentioned, and Nip Gwillian, who is just the absolute worst. Get out of here, you disgusting Gwillian. Alex also illustrated Ven 
Vengeful Dead, which was featured on an Arena League life counter, which I used to have. It's also worth mentioning that the art on Minamo's meddling, Hallow, Karam, and Decimate can be aligned to create a really funny scene wherein a laser beam bounces around and totally wrecks a dude. That's pretty neat, right? If you think that's pretty neat, leave a comment below that says YES in all caps with 10 exclamation points. When analyzing the art for Skirk Drill Sergeant, the basic action and relationship being depicted was something we glossed over. The key emotional cues being projected by these inhuman creatures tells a strong story of cruel indifference and relatable hesitance. The Drill Sergeant can see the horrors unfolding on the battlefield below, but has no qualms about throwing another life into the fray to fulfill his obligation. Is that really what a Drill Sergeant even does though? I've never served in the military, although I used to carry a Swiss Army knife with me, which I think gives me some insights and also honorary Swiss citizenship. Additionally, I've seen what I can only expect are incredibly accurate depictions of drill sergeants in films like Full Metal Jacket, Toy Story, The Frighteners, and just pretty much any other movie that featured R. Lee Ermey. If you haven't seen The Frighteners, it's legitimately one of my favorite movies. It was directed by Peter Jackson, who also directed the adaptation of J.K. Tolkien's series Game of Thrones. That joke seems notably less funny the second time around. I also have major pain written down here, but honestly, I don't actually really remember anything about that movie, but there is a strange force that resides deep within me that prevents me from not mentioning Major Payne, so I am mentioning it now. I don't even think the main character was a drill sergeant in that movie. According to Jimmy Wales Super Dictionary, a drill sergeant is a shouty guy in the military who trains soldiers to walk good. While a drill sergeant will often serve in that position for a time and then move on to other things, including seeing combat, it doesn't seem like you would ever have an active drill sergeant in the field commanding infantry to take action. Looking at Magic's other drill sergeants, or drill masters in the case of less specific military rank systems, they all seem more training oriented. Aki Drillmaster is another goblin and he is just zapping the daylight out of his friend's posterior. The flavor text here, as with most goblins, is meant for comedic effect. What part of Hayaku Aki did you not understand? The joke here is that we as the audience likely don't understand any of it, but due to the wonder that is advanced computer technology, I can easily provide you with a translation of this actual Japanese phrase. I'm not going to, but I could. It's also curious that the Japanese version of this card has just a direct translation of the flavor text, so the joke of not being able to understand the phrase is probably completely lost. Cavalry Drillmaster has a strong teacher vibe to him, and Cobalt Drill Sergeant is somehow wearing a modern military uniform and chest poking a dumbfounded Cobalt in front of a giant skull made out of melting marshmallows. Despite possessing truly bewildering artwork, this helmet wearing, riding crop wielding sergeant is depicted in the most conventional sense. He is actually training these new recruits in a non-combat setting with the zeal of a strict disciplinarian. The chevron on his shoulder also seems to resemble the actual patch for a sergeant first class in the United States military. So bonus points for accuracy, I guess? By contrast, our Skirk Drill Sergeant appears more like a regular sergeant. The mechanical function of Skirk Drill Sergeant also has little resemblance to training. As a 2-1 for 2 mana, this grinning maniac is certainly capable of fighting himself. His ability also revolves around this disregard for safety, as when his fellow combatants perish gleefully in battle, the Sarge allows you to pay 2 in a red and try to find another, revealing the top card of your library for all to see. You get to then put that card onto the battlefield if it is also a goblin. This ability is actually kind of unique. Goblins are known for cheating their friends into play, but this death trigger is some kind of hybrid between Zoologist, which is also illustrated by Alex Horley, and Sigil of the New Dawn, maybe? Overall, this ability seems more like recruitment than running drills, and they could have just called the card Skirk Recruiter. Its ability even works well alongside Goblin Recruiter, who puts goblins on top of your library, or Bogart Harbinger, who puts a single goblin on top of your library, or Marrow Harbinger, who can put a Razorfin Hunter on top of your library, because Razorfin Hunter is somehow a goblin and a merfolk, or Mwanguli Beast Tracker, which can put a nimble bird sticker or a goblin mutant on top of your library, or you can use Kithkin Harbinger to get our old friend Mistform Ultimus, or any creature with the changeling ability, which would be both a Kithkin and a goblin. Now that I think about it, Mistform Ultimus is also a Gwilian. Get out of here, you Gwilian trash. You can also use Worldly Tutor or Congregation at Dawn to just put any creature on top of your library. You can also use Enlightened Tutor to put Bogart shenanigans on top of your library because it's a tribal goblin enchantment. But you can't use Mystical Tutor to put Tarfire on top of your library for Skirk Drill Sergeant because after being reprinted in Dual Decks Elves vs. Goblins, the rules text was clearly changed to state Goblin Permanent, and Tarfire is an instant which is not a permanent. Sorry, Tarfire. This is the first card we've discussed which has seen reprinting, although being reprinted in a dual deck and in Vintage Masters isn't really the same as being reprinted in a mainline product. While the original Legion's printing has the very cool Spear and Shield Coat of Arms set symbol, the dual decks all had pretty mediocre set symbols, and this one is no different. The half bow, half axe symbol just feels very noodly and busy. Elves vs. Goblins was released in 2007 and featured a host of very playable
Purple Goblins, like the Prospector, the Ringleader, the Warchief, the Rager, the Matron, Gem Palm Incinerator, Siege Gang Commander, Mog War Marshal, Mog Fanatic, and two Drill Sergeants. It also had three Tarfires and two Bogart Shenanigans, meaning that a large number of new players who purchased these decks likely got into heated arguments about which of these non-creature cards could be put into play with Drill Sergeant's ability, which is a great way for Wizards of the Coast to promote learning moments for new players. The entirety of this deck was then reprinted in Dual Decks Anthology in 2014, before the Dual Deck line of products was discontinued. Oh, my. My poor vocal cords. In Vintage Masters, an online-only draft product, Skirk Drill Sergeant returned as a common. Goblins was an archetype in that format, and in that deck, Skirk Drill Sergeant was likely pretty good, with tolerable base stats and a grindy mana sink to help you close out games that are slipping away. Being downshifted also puts it into popper legality, where it doesn't seem to have really caught on, with Goblin decks favoring more aggressive one-drops. It does seem to have shown up in a couple of Peasant decks, a format which allows a few uncommons, and while Skirk Drill Sergeant itself is no longer uncommon, it better benefits greatly from the presence of cards like Goblin Recruiter and that Bogart shenanigans. EDH Rec shows our Instructive Skirk Ridge native showing up in 257 decks, which might be a new record for the channel, and makes a lot of sense because of the popularity of commanders like Krenko, who want goblins, but don't even really care who they are or what they do. These Goblin EDH decks are also popular budget builds, and at 16 American cents, Skirk Drill Sergeant's military rank certainly outpaces its monetary cost. The most success this Sergeant of Drills has ever had was in limited Pro Tour where it accompanied Huey Jensen to a first place team's finish in Boston and Matthias Jorstedt to a first place finish in Yokohama, both in 2003. Both of these decks were black-red decks, and neither had a ton of reasons to activate Drill Sergeant's ability. Having black in your deck opens the door to putting goblins from your graveyard on top of your library for fantastic Drill Sergeant value. Activating the Drill Sergeant can also put non-goblin creatures into your graveyard for fantastic graveyard value, but attacking for two damage is also good. Getting into the fray is what goblins are all about after all, and the flavor text on the bossy ridge resider highlights that in a predictably comedic tone. Goblins in many franchises are shown to be simultaneously murderous and goofy. It's somewhat strange to invent a race of gleeful idiots who exist simply to wage war and perish comically at the hands of our guiltless protagonist. In disregarding the worth that these creatures' lives had and marking their unnatural deaths with little more than a chuckle, we are allowing these fictional depictions of an idealized enemy to convince us that war can be noble and simple and funny. Playing a game of Magic or Warhammer or Super Ghosts and Goblins would be bereft of joy if each dying bear and troll let out gurgling gasps as it lay slowly dying from its horrific wounds. If we were reminded of the families that these foes had, the hopes and dreams they once nourished, and the lack of agency they possessed in the unfortunate circumstances into which they were spawned. Goblins are almost always depicted as being funny, but looking at the face of the unfortunate volunteer who our drill sergeant is commanding, their expression doesn't elicit any laughter from me. I suggested earlier that Skirk Drill Sergeant was not fulfilling the role he would be expected to play, running drills and doing training exercises, but another part of being a drill sergeant that is commonly depicted is indoctrinating new soldiers. To remove the hesitancy that one might might have about the terrible realities that lie ahead in battle. The apprehension visible on the face of the spear-wielding goblin doesn't appear to have been brainwashed away in this fashion, but maybe they aren't the target of the indoctrination. When was the last time that you thought about the well-being of the creatures you send into battle? When was the last time you mourned the death of a goblin? You've been running drills for years. Every time you shuffle up, the brainwashing is complete, my friend. You are the new recruit, and casual violence has become your pastime. So despite the oxymoronic flavor text, Skirk Drill Sergeant is not a funny card. There is nothing funny about war. War is H-E double hockey sticks. So grab your spear, soldier, and get ready to get gored by a Triceratops. Because we gotta kick some fascist buns. Hey everybody, that's the end of episode number, uh, I don't even know what number it is. I hope you're doing alright. Making these episodes is, is legitimately, uh, just a ridiculous amount of work somehow. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, go ahead and leave a comment. Leave three comments. Maybe like the video. Maybe subscribe. Click the little Taco Bell icon. Maybe blackmail your friends into subscribing to my channel. But whatever you do, I hope you have a good time doing it. And I hope you'll join me on the next episode of... Imagine. Imagine.